Good morning. I want to begin by reading a short passage of scripture from the lectionary text for today. This is from the book of John, chapter 14. I'm reading verses 15 through 20. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Passages like this must have been on the minds of many of the early reformers and revivalists in our church history. We see in this scripture passage and coming from the mouth of Jesus that loving God means a changed life. We see Jesus speaking of the indwelling spirit of God. And we see Jesus telling us that the very life that is his will be ours as believers. The hymn that we're going to talk about today is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling from the Chalice Hymnal number 517, also found in many other hymnals. If you have a hymnal at home that you can consult, please get it now and turn to that hymn so we can look at it together. This hymn is from the pen of Charles Wesley. He lived in the 1700s, born in 1707 and dying in 1788. Charles Wesley was one of the principal founders and leaders of a revival and holy living movement within the Anglican Church, a movement that eventually became the Methodist denomination. Charles came from a long line of distinguished ministers, mostly in the Anglican Church. His father, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather were all Ang Anglican ministers, and all three of them, at one time or another, had been disciplined or reprimanded for holding non-traditional views, which basically meant criticizing the Anglican Church. On his mother's side, her father had actually been a Puritan preacher. So you can see that he came from not only a long line of ministers, but controversial as well. Many, if not most, of his siblings either were ministers or became distinguished in theology, in missionary work, in literature, and in education. His father had been a poet and Charles began writing poetry at an early age. He also must have had a strong musical gene. Son became organist for the king and spent much of his career as personal organist to the royal family. Another son became known as the English Mozart, and a grandson was one of the foremost 19th century English composers. So for most of his life, Charles was what we would call a hymn-writing preacher. But during that long career as a pastor, Charles wrote 6,500 hymns. Think of that. If he wrote his hymns over a period of 65 years, that's 100 hymns every single year. Every three or four days, a new hymn. Love divine, all loves excelling is sometimes judged to be his finest hymn, or at least one of his very finest. And that is saying a lot because Charles Wesley is the writer of such famous hymns as Christ the Lord is Risen Today, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. In fact, there are 13 of his hymns in our Chalice Hymnal. And it's not uncommon to find as many as 20 hymns by Charles Wesley 
in a typical modern hymnal. This hymn was published in 1747. As with all hymns by Charles Wesley, this one is richly and deeply theological, and it abounds in biblical references and phrases. You'll hear the phrase Alpha and Omega, which echoes Revelation 21.6. You'll hear about the casting of crowns, which echoes Revelation 4.10. Changed from glory into glory is an echo of 2 Corinthians 3.18. Many other biblical phrases are to be found. Faithful mercy. Breathe thy Holy Spirit. The concept of inheritance. The concept of rest. And many more. The theology of this hymn, as you might also expect, has proven controversial, at least in some quarters. The uh, phrase second rest is contained in Wesley's original wording. That phrase is now commonly changed to promised rest, but that was seen when, uh, when he said second rest as a reference to a Pentecostal experience and that was considered controversial in that time. Also in the second verse, where uh, he prays that God would save us from the power of sinning. Uh, that phrase today is almost always changed in a hymnal to love of sinning or bent to sinning. And there again, some saw his original phrase as referring to God creating us perfect as Christians, which was an idea that he leaned toward but was not uh, well accepted by many of his peers. Verse 4 begins with the phrase, finish then thy new creation. Others also saw that as a hint of his idea about perfection in the present life, and in some hymnals that was changed to carry on your new creation. Personally, I think a lot of this is just nitpicking. This is a great piece of poetry, expression of prayer and praise that we should enjoy and take to heart. The tune that we sing it to is called Beecher from a composer named John Zundel, who is best known as the music director and organist of Brooklyn's Plymouth Church under the famous preacher Henry Ward Beecher, for whom he named this tune. Zundel was a music educator, an organist, composer, an arranger, a choir, and bandmaster. He was, he was the consummate church musician. Along with Henry Ward Beecher, he compiled a hymnal for their church and wrote several new tunes, including this one, Beecher. I'll only say about the tune that it is a creative but consistent tune. It was written specifically to go with Charles Wesley's words here. So obviously he had in mind every phrase, every beat, and he did what he did for a purpose. It consists of a series of alternating phrases of eight counts and seven counts. This type of meter is called 8787 eight, doubled. And if you look at the meter and the notes in the hymnal, you'll see that count six of each phrase consists of two eighth notes. But all the other counts in all the phrases are simply quarter notes. This gives that tune a solid feel, almost like a march. And I think he wrote, he wrote it that way with a purpose in order to make the tune support those words that so firmly teach about Christ's care for us and God's giving to us the very life of Christ. This consistent meter makes the song easy to learn, easy to memorize, easy to harmonize, and also easy to play on a keyboard. So now we will look at the words to that hymn and sing it together. Now forget about the analysis that I gave you in the first part of this video and we're just going to sing and enjoy this glorious hymn. 
This hymn is in fact a prayer, a prayer in four parts. The first stanza is a prayer for divine love to enter into and fill our hearts. The second stanza is a prayer for the Holy Spirit to come and be within us and perform his work. The third stanza is a prayer for the life that is in Christ to enter into us as believers. And the fourth stanza is for God to finish the great new work that he began in us as believers. <laughs> 